Welcome to the Personal Development Mastery Podcast. Stand out, don't fit in. Today I am delighted to be speaking with uh, Michel Mercier. Michel, you are a coach and a speaker, and you have worked with a wide range of businesses from acclaimed non-profits to Fortune 500 corporations. After spending over 15 years in the corporate world, you took a leap of faith and ventured out on your own entrepreneurial journey, building your own business from the ground up and going through all sorts of uh, twists and turns, both personally and professionally. You now use your experience and expertise to help other female entrepreneurs thrive uh, in their journeys. Michelle, welcome to the show. I'm uh, super excited to be speaking with you today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really, I'm really excited to speak to you too. So, <laughs> the feeling is mutual. <laughs> that's brilliant. That's a, always a great start to any conversation. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> uh, Michelle, I want uh, to start with, I want you to share with us a key defining moment in your life journey, especially related to your personal development or transformation. Yeah. So <laughs> So many, so many, but I'll pick one. <laughs> so I think, I think the biggest one for me is what I like to call my floor moment. Um, many people have them. For me, it was on my kitchen floor, um, but it was, you know, hysterically crying on my kitchen floor. It was the day that I had just been told that I was laid off of kind of my six figure comfy paycheck job because they had outsourced our team. Um, and you know, in that moment, it was like the rug had come out from underneath me. For the months prior to that, I'd been dealing with, um, my son had severe medical issues. So I was in and out of hospitals trying to get him stable, different things like that. And I could handle all that um, for some reason, you know, because I was on autopilot. But for me personally, at that moment, I couldn't handle my, my career being taken away because it was so, so rooted in who I was, um, which was a which was problematic um, on some levels. I think, you know, and in that moment, I, I felt I had a decision to make that I could easily kind of slide back into, you know, another job that was similar, you know, or I could venture out on my own. And for me, I didn't really like who I was at that time. I was working, you know, 60 plus hours. I had children that, you know, I really didn't see. Um, as much as I would like to have seen. I was on a plane to Europe for work back and forth a lot. Um, and I was exhausted. So, you know, for me personally, I think, I really do believe that we're either you make the decision to change your life or the universe makes it for you. And I think in that moment, the rug just got pulled out, but it was strategically pulled out, we'll say, mm -hmm. <laughs> if that makes sense. Um, so I think that for me kind of it started so much of my journey that personal development wise, that was, that was a pretty, that was a pretty big moment in my life for me. So when you had that uh, flow moment, as you said, <laughs> did you have yeah. a, a pretty good idea of what kind of uh, business you wanted to, to create for yourself? I didn't. All right. <laughs> so okay. I think, I think in that, in that kind of clarity it was great. But what I had to do was kind of undo a lot of the stuff that I had, you know, learned or the thought patterns that had come. So could I have easily taken, you know, my, my learnings from my corporate career and, and before that and kind of just applied it to a, a steadfast business model? Absolutely. But I actually wanted to do the complete opposite. Um, a lot of people ask me, they're like, well, where's your marketing plan? Where's your business plan? And I was like, yeah, I'm not doing any of that. Um, I just wanted to find me again. Um, because honestly, I knew, and my company on paper is called Create Honesty, um, because I didn't, because I didn't recognize myself. And that was my first and foremost first focus was to, you know, figure out who I was in order to figure out, you know, what I wanted to do with my time and how I wanted to spend it. So I went through a lot of different versions of the business that's now, um, everything from, you know, hosting educational documentaries for women to running community-based projects to, you know, but the whole time I've been coaching women. So, I mean, that just felt as I came through everything as like the natural thing that I should be doing. I see. So 
when I asked you about give, giving us a key defining moment, you said there are so many. So <laughs> from that time, then from your uh, floor moment to establishing your business, give us another key defining moment that shifted things uh, very much for you. Yeah. So um, there was a moment when my husband and I had a conversation, you know, as I mentioned, my, my kids are We've been super sick and we have lots of kind of ups and downs as a family mm-hmm. over the last couple of years, some, some pretty severe things. Um, you know, and I would say that one of the main defining moments of the conversation my husband and I had about, you know, how we wanted this to impact our lives, how we wanted all of it to impact our lives. Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes when you get stuck in such a high stress situation, it begins to define you. You know, so we, we actually had a conscious decision and made a conscious decision and had the conversation to kind of not let all of the stress, all of the, you know, trauma on some levels define our family or define us. And, you know, we made a choice to purposely infuse joy into our lives and into the lives of our kids. And that's, believe it or not, that takes a lot more work than I think, you know, people realize is to purposely put the joy in the mix and have fun despite the adversity. Any uh, tips on how to do that for, for people who listen? Because you, <laughs> yeah, of course. You, well, it's uh, somehow it should be our natural state being in joy, but uh, our natural state seems to be more of a stressful one. So yeah, it takes effort yeah. actually to shift into being playful and uh, happy. <laughs> and it's so interesting how that happens, right? Because when we're kids, it's completely the opposite, right? <laughs> um, where joy is the first instinct and the stress is like, what's stress? Um, So I do find that as we get older and more responsibilities pile up, you know, it's an afterthought, which is sad on so many levels. So like we literally schedule it. Like it is, it will be in my planner. And I work with some of my clients with that too, because they're, they're so busy or they're, you know, so entrenched in the hustle or the grind or work that, you know, I will literally say, no, 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 open your calendar. (laughs) Where's the fun going? Where's the joy going? Um, because for me, what I've learned over the years is when I start getting cranky and exhausted, it's probably because like I haven't picked my head up from my laptop in a while and I haven't gone and, and actually had fun and enjoyed life. <laughs> so that's, you know, schedule it. That as silly as that might sound, like that's sometimes the only way you're going to get it in. No, I don't think it sounds silly at all. Actually, I think... <laughs> many people will relate to that. I certainly can relate to that because I think we all suffer from time to time with overwhelm and doing to do more and more. But uh, at some point, we really need to take a step back and rest for a day maybe or something to to recharge. Otherwise, we risk. We're not productive anyway. And we're exactly miserable and grumpy. And I doubt if we are productive uh, either. But uh, yeah. Um, so uh, Michelle I want to ask about that uh, leap of faith that you you took from that time from uh, not going back into a similar job than the one that you have to creating your your own business and you know all the the challenges that you had to face so Mm -hmm. was uh, can you tell me the um, the mindset that it took for you or some difficulties that you had to overcome in your head, in your head to go to the other side, to the uncomfortable outside of your comfort zone and familiarity. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, there were so many, so many kind of old programmings per se that were, that were there. And I mean, as you and I talked about before, I started way back in the day as kind of a more free spirit theater and music person. So if you had told that, you know, 18 year old version of Michelle that I would be would have been running like high powered corporate teams, I would have told you you were out of your mind. (laughs) Right. (laughs) So For me, you know, kind of, but I think I went into that. And what I found when I was speaking to people too, through my journey was that there were a lot of shoulds, right. So I checked all the boxes that I should have to get the happiness, right? It's somewhere along the line, I kind of said, okay, well, I I should have a job with a paycheck. I should do this. I should do that. And when I made that decision, you know, to, to make the the leap into entrepreneurship, number one, not only did I cut our household income in half, (laughs) which was scary as hell, um, 
you know, which that in itself, there comes with a lot of learnings around um, routines you know, where you're just able to just drop whatever money you have, you know, because that's the budget that you're used to. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of that I realized was tied to uh, filling a void as well. So, you know, spending money here and not thinking about it or buying stuff I didn't need or, you know, my time being used in different ways that wasn't necessarily productive. That's the stuff I got back through my journey. Um, It was hard though, because again, our budget and everything, where we everything was set up on two salaries so we went Mm. through that transition but for me personally on the inside I think there's a lot of self-doubt there was a lot of like what are you out of your mind like why would you leave the comfy paycheck and the stability of a nine-to-five job and your vacation time for you know this craziness but as I went through it all and as I as I kind of you know got a little bit more comfortable being an entrepreneur it it dawned on me that this is how I've always been. I've always, even in the, even in the corporate setting, I was always kind of, you know, thinking outside the box, you know, maybe making some waves where they didn't like it because I'm a big thinker. Um, You know, so even though there was a lot of self-doubt and I had to kind of say, okay, I see you self-doubt. I respect that you're there for a reason. Fear, welcome to the party, (laughs) you know, have a seat. I'll listen to you. But there was part of me that had kind of, when I made the leap, it was kind of burn the bridges behind me, um, you know, because I knew if I, if I left the safety net of some sort, and I mean, I did work a part-time job in the very beginning, mm-hmm. um, but I knew if I left the safety net, the transformation for myself personally and professionally may not have happened. That's always uh, a strategy that as scary as it sounds. I mean, burning the yeah. boats or the bridges is <laughs> scary. Yeah. But it, because it forces you to, to make it, because there is no yeah. alternative. The alternative is uh, <laughs> total yeah. failure. So uh, yeah. you yeah. mentioned self-doubt. Were there any techniques, any tools you used to overcome this? Yeah, so I, I, when I first started out, I worked, with, I worked with a coach. And at one mm-hmm. point in time, I said to him, you know, I was so frustrated. I'd made a lot of other people in my corporate career and beyond tons of money, right? And mm-hmm. I was like, why can't I just do it for myself? And he asked me, you know, well, do you feel worthy of it? And I was like, what the hell does worthy have to do with anything? And that was kind of a light bulb moment. Um, you know, for that self-doubt, I really had to, and I still do, I do a lot of affirmations around worthiness and receiving, um, I do a lot of work around money mindset and the fact that I deserve it and that it can come to me. And I'm constantly kind of rooting myself in that abundance mentality as well and trying to stay away from having a scarcity mentality of, oh my gosh, there's not enough money, I'm never gonna get it, oh my goodness, and that kind of fear spiral. Um, So I've learned over the years that worthiness is usually, you know, creeping in (laughs) Um, or that those old stories around worthiness. So I've done a lot of work because it's a, your business is a reflection of you as an entrepreneur on a lot of levels. So, and especially as a coach, I have, I have to do the work. I can relate to that. That's why you, you see me <laughs> nodding now. I mean, yeah. the, we won't hear that, but I was nodding all along because yeah. the, the worthiness, the feeling of deserve, and there are some programs in the subconscious that uh, many of us have without even being aware of them. And exactly. to stop you on your track. Sometimes you try to do something or go beyond what you're used to. And yeah. some there is some self doubts and self sabotage, and you don't even know why you're doing it. So it's, uh, yeah, affirmations, exactly. all these things certainly help, or working with the subconscious directly. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm just curious, when you were working in your corporate job, before you uh, had, uh, before you were laid off, were you happy working there? Mm. <laughs> okay, that's why. Probably I, not. I, I get um, the yeah, okay. I mean, I just, there were happy parts, I parts, think. Okay. You know, I think there were parts when I was challenged. At one point, I was running the PayPal Europe um, operations and for their email marketing team. Mm-hmm. And I was brought in to fix a lot of things that needed improvement. And that to me was stimulating, right? I'm a, I'm a fixer. I like to think out of the box and then implement. Like I yeah. love that type of stuff. So that stuff mm-hmm. made me happy. But I think I also was so busy kind of proving my worth during that period of time that, you know, at one point I had a month long migraine because I was working so much. 
um, you know, I couldn't look at screens, I couldn't function, <laughs> you know, and I, I think I was surface happy, if that makes sense. Yes. Everything looked really good and shiny, but uh, deep down, I was kind of, you know, dying a little bit inside. <laughs> mm -hmm. I see. I, <laughs> I kind of was expecting a similar answer. Yeah. I just wanted to make <laughs> sure. So, Michelle, talk to us uh, about resilience then, because it is something that you you are very much an advocate uh, of, and because you have to have, uh, you've had to have the resilience in your own progress and journey. And yeah. uh, so tell me its importance. Why do you think people don't have it? And what is it apart from actually life throwing things at you? What else can yeah. we do to cultivate it? Yeah, so I think I think resilience for me, and I, there's a great quote from Sheryl Sandberg that speaks to this that I read, and it describes it perfectly. And it talks about resilience being a muscle. Mm -hmm. um, and the more that it, you actually deal with stuff, the stronger that muscle becomes. And I believe at the end of her quote, she says that like, you know, you just may become the best version of yourself. So when I read that quote, the light bulb kind of went off because in a pa over the past four or five years, our family has dealt with a lot and I've still managed to build two businesses during that time. Mm -hmm. So, and some people may equate it to kind of powering through, but powering through only gets you so far. So I've learned over, over the years and through my experiences that, you know, working those muscles and understanding that it is a muscle of resilience is key. And then also, you know, taking the learnings from that, those times, so I know for myself, if I push and push and push, I will get sick, right? That is just something I've learned about myself. And I think I've honored that piece of myself. And I've begun to understand, you know, that piece, that's a piece of building my resilience muscle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm, I'm beginning as I get older to kind of lean more into the hard situations in a healthy way. Whereas I think the first inclination for people is to kind of hold it at arm's length and say, no way, not going through this this sucks, don't want to touch it. Whereas, mm -hmm. you know, over time, and as that muscle becomes stronger, you, you really just kind of go through it with more ease and flow, not necessarily acceptance <laughs> at the time, because it's hard. I mean, and in in, I think there's also a point in which somebody needs to give equal weight to the positive and the negative. And I think that's a big part of resilience. One can't exist without the other, unfortunately. And I think sometimes we are pushed upon to just be happy, you know, only always look on the bright side, all of that stuff. But without those hard moments, you're never, you're never going to learn. You're not going to, and I teach that to my, my four and seven year olds too, you know, mistakes, failures, hard times, all of those things are, are ways to build your toolbox. Quite frankly, they're, they're hard and they're going to suck. But at the same time, you know, resilience is such a valuable tool so that when a wave comes, maybe you don't stay down as long. Maybe you come back quicker. So when I found over the years of just kind of horrible things happening to us over here that I was able to rebound quicker and mm -hmm. quicker mm -hmm. and quicker. And I think... I tend to give a lot of grace and a lot of space to myself. You know, for example, pandemic, hello, horrible, horrible situation that we're in. But I have seen some people who are not used to dealing with adversity struggle harder than maybe some of us who have dealt with trauma, dealt with unimaginable things. Mm -hmm. Not that it doesn't make it any harder, but it makes it a little easier to kind of bounce back, if that makes sense. It does. So I think that's kind of the way that I view resilience as a muscle that needs to be built up and you know it's not a finite you know amount that you just use up either it's something as humans we're built we're built to you know be resilient we just need to kind of admit that things are hard and lean into the learning so i hope that answers your question <laughs> that, uh, i like what you say about leaning in uh, to yeah. the, uh, the situation rather than fighting it it is a uh, a different approach and uh, yeah you can I mean you can deny it and maybe mm -hmm. that's the human the, the normal human thing to do when we're faced with a problem the first thing to <laughs> the first instinctive reaction is no this can't be true or something like right. that but eventually you have to face it 
address it and accept it at the very end. Uh, exactly, absolutely. exactly. And I think, you know, there's, there's a great quote that, I don't remember who said it, it says, the pain is not the problem, the lies about the pain is the, are the problem, essentially. <laughs> um, and I found over my years that I can only ignore it for so long. And every, all of us can only ignore that stuff for so long. It's coming back. And it may come back as a crick in your neck. It may come back because your inability to sleep at night. It may come back in a lot of different forms, explosive mm -hmm. anger, um, anxiety attacks, whatever that looks like, but it's not going away. <laughs> so at some point you have to kind of give it equal airtime and an equal opportunity to exist in your life. I 100% agreed. Yes. Um, let me ask you something uh, different then, Michelle. Yes. You, you talk about, uh, I was reading your website and you said something like uh, you believe that uh, the work-life balance is a myth. So can you expand on this? I personally yes. agree, but I want to see what your... <laughs> yeah. Your I just, I can't, I can't stand that term. Um, <laughs> it just makes me angry because, you know, everyone is always like, find work-life balance. And it always makes me feel like I'm failing at it, quite frankly, because, you know, and especially as a coach, we tend to do kind of a pie chart with our clients and say, okay, slice the pie chart up into sections, you know, as to how you want your life to look. Well, work is one of those slices. So a slice can't balance with the whole pie. So I never really understood that <laughs> phrase, um, you know, and I, I much rather preferred, maybe it's the entrepreneur in me is work-life integration, mm. because I think there, one thing I did learn from my corporate background with juggling that with kids is sometimes it's quality over quantity, you know, so I don't necessarily need to, to be interacting with everything, everybody and controlling every single thing in my household. But when I do, it needs to be of quality. And I would much rather it be there mm -hmm. um, because my work is in my objective behind my work is to bring freedom for my family and freedom for myself on a lot of levels. So if I try to balance those two, I'm just going to lose. So I'd rather just kind of integrate them and, and have them all live together in the, in the pie chart, I guess. <laughs> yeah. And Balancing them, I think, by definition, means that they are on opposite ends. So you try to exactly. balance two completely different things, which uh, yeah, it doesn't sound right if you really think about no. it. And, I, it and you, yeah, and you can always fall out of balance. And I'm like, eh, you know, that's not what I'm going for. Like, I want, I want to constantly be in a flow, um, but I don't, I don't want the like black and white thinking of either in balance or out of balance. I don't like that. I suppose that term applies more to people that are really not wanting to be doing the job that they do. So they try to balance it with yeah. their life. So they, they kind yeah. of think of it as a necessary evil to be able to live my life, which, as you know very well, it's very common. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it's very common. It shouldn't yeah. be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, if anything, maybe, maybe the one upside is that those folks that you're, you're speaking about, Maybe if they're told work-life balance, work-life balance, life, like it'll be a reminder <laughs> to them to remember that life is a thing. Mm. Um, but other than that, yeah, that word, that term makes me, ugh, I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> um, tell me about authenticity then. It was something else I wanted to ask you about. Uh, what do you think stops people from uh, being authentic and why is it important to be authentic? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, one of the largest things that I've seen that blocks people and myself included, I mean, we've all done it on some level is, you know, a fear of being excluded or a fear, yeah. fear of not belonging, Yeah. you know, so, or a fear of being rejected for who you really are. And maybe that's something that comes with age as well, where I don't, I'm not, I'm not feeling that as much anymore. And I think it's, it's more important to me to honor who I am and, you know, and to show my children, you know, that level of authenticity than it is to be kind of accepted. Um, but a lot of people don't see the world that way, mm -hmm. right? And I can admire, not admire, I can appreciate the fact that maybe their entire lives or their structures are anchored in that. Um, and that's a pretty big change to make for, for a lot of folks. So when it comes to authenticity, 
you know, I think authentic is kind of a word that's used everywhere now. It's a, it's a very popular word, but I think it, it needs to be, and it needs to be used in the sense of the good and the bad, right? Um, when I give speeches, I, I tend to talk about resilience and I talk through some of the bad things that I've been through and some of the difficult things. And it's amazing how many people will say, oh, me too. I thought I was alone in that. You know, so I think people understand that as you become your more authentic self, there are other people who are doing the same thing and then you feel less alone, which mm -hmm. is contradictory to the fear that kept you there. So it's really, it's really interesting when you look at that, when you look at it that way. It's fascinating, indeed. I, and what you said that the the older we get, the less we seem to. I'll use the word care, <laughs> care about what, because some people will like us for who we yeah. are. Some people won't, and uh, it has taken me personally over a long time to realize that the people who don't like me, well, it's none of my business. I mean, this, it's okay. nothing I can do, or I should try to please them at the very end, but. Uh, yeah, it is something that uh, especially younger people have much more and they, they try, especially in this social media society of trying to yeah. uh, look always uh, the best, even if it's completely fake. And... Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, you know, and I, I think it's that pleasing and that performing and that, you know, where you're getting the accolades from, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, as, as kids, if it was something that you got praised for, of course, maybe you're going to keep doing it, right? But it doesn't mean that you can't choose not to do it later on. And I think sometimes we all get on that one path and we mm -hmm. think there aren't any other paths. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I, and I see it as you do too, all the people who are kind of stuck in those jobs that you know they don't want to be in, they, they don't know how to get out. They are just kind of locked into a life that they'll do until the end. Whereas, you know, I prefer, as I'm sure you do too, to, I don't want to get to the end and, and realize that there were things that I could have taken a right instead of a left. I don't, I don't want to do that. Yeah, regret uh, is, uh, is, I think it's the worst, uh, or the, the heaviest emotion that you can have, especially at the end of our life when there's nothing we can do about it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Michelle, in your uh, coaching business, you uh, empower women to break old part, uh, patterns, build self-awareness and map out a plan uh, to live the life they want. Let me ask you, I often see a trend of female coaches coaching women only. So what do you think this is? Is it a matter of your unique niche and core competency or is it something else? Yeah. Um, you know, I think, I think there's, there, there's a slight difference when it comes to the stories that women tell themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that society tells women as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think that in itself is a, is a nuanced kind of thing to coach for, whereas, you know, we, we process things differently. So I, I've seen a lot of women kind of come to me and they'll be like, fix my pipeline, fix my marketing strategy, fix my this. And I'm like, yeah, it's probably not that. It's probably your head. So, <laughs> I mean, we'll do both. We'll do a little bit of both, but, you know, because I can speak to both sides of it. But I think that can, can somewhat be unique to women, that integration of, mm -hmm. you know, worth translated in your ability to do business. Whereas in the past, what I've seen from men, and I'm not saying there aren't men who are, you know, dealing with emotional issues, because there's certainly that's, I have two sons, that's a completely different challenge. Um, but, you know, I just, I just see a little bit more compartmentalization with men. So that's, that's kind of why I stick with, with females, because I like to kind of pull those, pull those apart, and then reintegrate the pieces in a healthier way. And, and also, you know, I've, I've walked in those shoes. So, and I would never want to kind of give advice or coach somebody. I like to have walked through some of those situations and not to say that I wouldn't coach a, a gentleman. I definitely would. Mm -hmm. um, but I think for me, it was just kind of a natural shift because I'm very women empowerment focused and things like that, which, which is very weird because I have two boys. So I call it, I call my company, my daughter, <laughs> honestly, <laughs> because, because I'm very, you know, but it, it keeps, it keeps me balanced on that route or balanced, integrated <laughs> um, for that as well. No, I understand. It was something that uh, just, I wanted your, your opinion from uh, your point of view, because it is something I, I see very, 
frequently and uh, you know being a man myself i'm just trying to understand because the, the opposite is not very common is it to have men coaches saying i'm empowering men only it's poor that's that's yeah. my perception anyway yeah i mean though i've seen a lot of men who will do both i've seen a lot of women who will do both sure. um I think, I think it's all the personal preference. And I think in the people that I'm surrounding in, because I also run a women's organization. Yeah. So for me, like my, my clientele is kind of in my backyard. So that makes sense. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, I understand what you're saying about that. Sure. So tell me about uh, increasing self-worth, which is one of the things that you do with your clients. So in a, in a nutshell, what, what is it? How do you do that? <laughs> Yeah. So, I mean, I look at coaching similar to a lot of the time a consultant will look at with a company, you know, mm -hmm. you go in and you look at current state and you map it all out. I mean, I dig, I, I dig for stuff with my clients. You know, I want to know like what stories were you told when you were younger about money? You know, what does that look like? And how is that translating now? What do your relationships look like? Everything about that current state. And then we turn around and we say, okay, with, out any boundaries, you know, you're not worried about money, you're not worried about anything, what does your ideal state look like? And then we, we tackle the in between those two things. And with that organically comes up those triggers. You know, if somebody is saying they want to make a million dollars, like in, in the case of my story, but they can't close a sale, mm -hmm. why? You know, um, but then also I do a lot of work with my clients around worthiness versus kind of discipline. So I think like an example of that is, you know, folks who say I'm not disciplined enough to go to the gym every single day for 30 days straight. Um, but again, I wouldn't say it's lack of discipline. I would say it's, do you feel like you're worthy for that? And also removing the black and white thinking of if you went 15 days versus zero versus 30 days, like it's still 15 days. So I do a lot of celebrating what has happened with my clients as well because they don't, they don't, they don't celebrate on their own. I don't celebrate on my own without my coach kind of prompting me on some level. Right? I'm raising my hand up. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think the first thing I'll do too, is I often have people come to me and they'll say, Oh my goodness, like I get nothing done. I'm so lazy. I don't, you know, I can't believe I haven't gotten stuff done. And, you know, I challenge that and I say, okay, let's prove it. Let's mm -hmm. prove that you've gotten nothing done. And I will literally have them log every single thing they've gotten done for a period of like three days. Okay. And they come back and they're like, oh, and I'm like, yeah, you were getting stuff done. Maybe it's not as strategic, but, you know, that's not true. That's not a true story. So when it comes to things like worthiness and, you know, breaking past beliefs and limiting beliefs, I often ask clients to ask themselves, is it true? Mm -hmm. You know, so when you hear that inner dialogue of, oh, my God, I suck and I'm horrible. Is it true? You know, it's either asking yourself, is it true or speaking in facts? right? Not just kind of this wishy-washy area of things. Mm -hmm. um, when it comes to your worthiness, everybody hates me, you know, is a story that you hear a lot. Is it true? And then look at the facts of it. Mm -hmm. So would so-and-so have helped you, you know, build your website if they hated you? <laughs> would so-and-so be going out to dinner if they hated you? You know, just kind of disproving some of that stuff mm -hmm. when it comes to worthiness. Sure. Um Michelle, explain to me what you say that uh, your approach in your coaching is holistic and empathetic. Can, can you explain that to me? How, how do you mean it? Yeah. So I think when I say holistic, I mean encompassing the, the whole woman. So okay. um, because I think with coaching, you often see either business coaches or life coaches. Mm -hmm. And again, if we go back to the integration piece of it, I'm not quite sure how that can happen. Mm -hmm. I mean, I call myself a business strategy coach because from a marketing perspective, I do feel like it's important to kind of pick a, pick a heavy or pick a lane. Sure. But I have yet to work with a woman where it was just strictly business conversations. I've never, I've, maybe, you know, maybe I will, maybe I'll see the unicorn, but I've never seen that happen. Um, so when I say I work holistically with, with people, that, that's why, because I don't believe we can just separate the two and I think it's a package deal and the integration of it all is really important. Mm -hmm. I see. I get that. Uh, because they say that it's 80% of the success or what we want to do is uh, psychology mindset. It's 20% yeah. with it's the, me the mechanics, the strategies. So 
once this yeah. is right, then the rest is uh, easier to pull through. Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. And, you know, that's why there's so many publications out there about habits for success and, you know, things mm-hmm. like that. Because mm-hmm. if you can, you know, the simple one that people always say is like making your bed every morning. Yeah. If you can build build a habit that occurs every single day like that, then you can build a pipeline. You can build email marketing messages. You can, you can do all that other stuff. Mm-hmm. So what are maybe a couple of your habits that uh, you think that they have contributed to your success? Yeah, so I, I love bookending my day. <laughs> and what that looks like is, you know, in the morning, mm-hmm. I tend to, I always listen to the, the same podcast. It's um, Sean Croxton's The Quote of the Day Show. I don't know if you've ever heard of that. I've actually but... have, yeah, years ago. Were, yeah, it's okay, inspired good. by him. Yeah, yeah. it was wow. yeah. <laughs> um, so that's one of the things I listen to because they're short and they're sweet and it's, you know, no more than like maybe 12, 15 minutes tops. So I do something like that. I am, you know, a big meditator. So mm-hmm. that's kind of woven into, and, you know, sometimes they're just like this morning, I just did a five minute quick meditation to ground myself before I transitioned into this interview. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and so that's kind of my morning and I, and I do a lot of walking as well too. So if I can integrate that in the morning, and then at night, you know, I tend to, to do gratitude, right? Mm-hmm. So gratitude, or at least I, and alongside the gratitude, I close off my day. So I found it very helpful for myself and for my clients, whereas, you know, I hear a lot of like, I'm waking up at two in the morning with like 15,000 things running through my head and the anxiety. So part of, you know, what my habits are is to either, you know, get it out of my head, brain dump it down, make that list roll over for the next day and close mm-hmm. off the one I just, I just finished. Um, or, you know, well, and, you know, a gratitude practice. So I have a, a great app on my phone and I, I don't, I try not to go to bed without doing that. Mm-hmm. So you, you type some things from the day. Is it uh, this kind yeah. of, a, of an, okay, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. And I think from a, from a to-do list perspective, I plan what I'm going to do for the week on a, well, I plan it quarterly, then monthly. And then on Sunday night, I plan what my week looks like personally and professionally and then on every day, I'm kind of monitoring that as well. That's a habit for me too. That's helpful. That's great. Fantastic. Uh, Michelle, let me ask you also some quick fire questions. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> what does <love> person- <laughs> Good. <laughs> <laughs> what does personal development mean to you? Always growing. Always growing and always evolving and moving forward in life been something that's part of my life since I was probably like 14 reading Mm. you know Louise Hay (laughs) all right yeah oh great um let's say you could go back in time and meet your 18 or your 20 year old uh, self what's the one piece of advice you would give her um I think I would tell her that it'll be okay I think you know there was a lot of stuff happening in my life around that part of the time. And I think I was hell bent on making it through and forcing it through, but maybe I'd educate her a little bit more about resilience muscles rather than the power through. Mm. Um, and that assure her that I would be okay. Great. Uh, let's say you had a, a magic wand and you could uh, wave it and change something in the world as it is today. What would you change? <laughs> Just one thing. <laughs> um, you know, I think I would put a lot more empathy back in mm-hmm. um, the world right now in compassion. Mm-hmm. You know, because I think, you know, I could have easily said, oh, wave my magic wand, the pandemic will be gone and all the hard things, but that's not going to help us, right? That's not going to help us grow as people. That's not going to, it'll suck, but it's, it'll serve a purpose emotionally on the back end. But I think, you know, I live over here in the U.S. I think we could use a lot more compassion for each other, active listening and empathy, for sure. Yeah. So true. That's great. Thank you for that. Um, You're welcome. Is there any major aha moment you've had uh, recently that you wanted to share with us? Oh, hmm, where to start? (laughs) You know, I think, I think my biggest aha moment of recent has been that, so we are still in, in somewhat lockdown over here. I don't know how, how you guys are over there, but. Partial, no, partial. not, not yeah. like uh, April. Not crazy but, lockdown, but yeah. Yeah, but, um, yeah. 
you know, and this was the first week that our, our children were able to go to, you know, a camp or somewhere okay. outside of right. home. Um, you know, and the aha moment for me was, you know, I liked, I liked, you know, as hard as it was having my two children home with us, you know, and it was, I couldn't believe I was admitting that because it was so damn <laughs> stressful, you know, but um, it was nice to, there were a lot of moments that I, that we had that we would never, have, we wouldn't have had. Mm -hmm. you know, with, with the kids. And I think my husband and I make a really good team when it comes to stuff like that. So I think the aha part of that was, you know, we don't need to be as busy. You know, there are, there are pieces of this situation that I'm really going to miss. And I was sad to send them off happy, happy as well, but um, mixed emotions. But the aha was kind of that, okay, well, the things that need to fall to the wayside will stay by the wayside and things that are important will rooted here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. So let me ask the opposite question then with uh, that. So any major mistake or lesson that you've had recently that you wanted to share so we can avoid doing it? Yeah, um, that I am not a perfect parent. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest lesson is there such um, a thing does it exist <laughs> no but i think we all have kind of this like this vision in our head of what parenting is going to look like and how amazing we're going to be at it and all these things um you know so i think i've had to give a lot of grace and space because of the stress and because of everything else that you know there's going to be moments that i suck at it and that you know we argue and that we don't like each other and all of those things but at the end of the day, you know, it's like any other kind of quote unquote failure. Um, you're going to learn from it. You're going to learn from it. And it, it helps us all move forward. Mm -hmm. too. So that's, that's kind of my greatest failure. I think in the <laughs> last couple of weeks, um, I say that loosely, but um, there's room, there's room for improvement as there always is. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's, it's never a mistake. I think it's, for me, it's only a mistake when you keep repeating it over and over again. Exactly. Otherwise, uh, yeah. if you learn from it, it's, it's uh, never a mistake. It's actually yeah. essential for uh, growth. Exactly. Exactly. That's how we Amen. learn. Yeah. Uh, Michelle, we, we've talked about lots of different things so far. Is there anything that you were really hoping I would ask you and I completely missed it? <laughs> Um, no, you asked some really great questions. Thank you. <laughs> so, no, um, I think, you know, you've, you've covered quite a bit and you've asked some really great questions. I mean, outside of that, I would just, I would just remind people to kind of use resilience and use the tools that they've been given to challenge their current state, mm -hmm. right? So to kind of at least, at least at minimum once a year, if not more, you know, and not necessarily at the new year. Um, just sit there and kind of assess it, like pick a random day in August to do it or something like that. That's not driven with a milestone to just kind of sit down and say, you know, am I happy? Is there joy in my life? Is this what I thought it would look like? And if not, how do I start moving forward to, to change that and not being scared of the pain that may come with that as well? Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Uh, how can people find out uh, more about you? Michelle, where would you direct them? Yeah, so I, my, my website is createhonesty.com. Mm -hmm. um, and Create Honesty is also my Facebook handle, my Twitter handle, and my Instagram handle. So you can just plug in Create Honesty um, all together on either one of those platforms and find me. And I also have a Facebook community, which is the Surviving Entrepreneurship Community, which you can also find on Facebook as well. That's great. I'll put them in the show notes for someone to find thank me. You. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank you very much, Michelle, for your uh, time and for your uh, for your words of wisdom that you've uh, thank shared you. with, with us today. Uh, and I want to wish you all the very best in your life and your business. Uh, any parting words? Um, you know, thank you. Thank you. Because I've, I've done a lot of interviews and I think your questions were, were amazing. And I just, I just love, I could speak about personal development all day long because it's, it's so <laughs> vital for, for people to really understand the value in that. So thank you for having me. I really appreciate that. Thank you very much for listening. Please take a moment to subscribe, rate and review Personal Development Mastery on Apple Podcasts. 
If you want to know more about me and how I can help you, join my Facebook group Personal Development Mastery. The link is in the show notes or you can simply type bit.ly slash pdm group. And until next time, stand out, don't fit in. Mm-hmm.